Hey guys, Bobby here from the GM table, and today we're going to be covering five tips to improve NPCs at your table. Okay, so first off, the top two systems I've been using lately are Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition and my personal all-time favorite, Savage Worlds. And the tips today are going to use some rules from Savage Worlds and some rules from D&D 5th edition, and I'm going to talk about how you can use both of those, as well as a few other general tips to make NPCs much more effective, dynamic, and interesting at your table. First of all, we're going to cover the basics. All NPCs should have motives, desires, some kind of goal, and something they want. This is everybody. This is those random goblins in a cave. They want something. This is crucial for NPCs, for NPCs you talk to, for NPCs you fight, any and all of them. They all want something. Now, you don't have to write a book about this. Just jot down one word. That's all you need. As long as you have that one word, it's something. Because when players throw you a loop and decide to talk to NPCs you think they were just going to fight, you have something. You have a goal. When you have to figure out what they would do on the battlefield, you have a goal. When you have to figure out what they're going to ask for in negotiations, you have a goal. Motives and goals are number one, always. Now, honestly, a lot of videos talk about this already, so it's kind of a given, but we always have to cover those, even if it's a given. Number two, this one is pulling from the Savage Worlds rules. Yes, one of these is going to be Savage Worlds, one of these is going to be D&D, but you can use them outside of it. Now, this is the reaction table. This is the newest one from Savage Worlds Adventures Edition, but it pretty much hasn't changed much from edition to edition. There's going to be something really important you'll notice here. No matter what the reaction is, it tells you how much an NPC is willing to do for how little of price. Almost no NPC does things for nothing. You can do this in D&D too, guys. You don't need to have a good persuasion role all of a sudden get the players everything they want. Yes, you succeeded. They're willing to make a deal with you. But there's always a price. That price combined with how much they're willing to do for you for that price is how you get how invested an NPC is. Now in Savage Worlds, and this is another thing to remember even for you Savage Worlds players, a success on persuasion rolls, intimidation roll, any social check just moves them up one notch on the reaction table. Even by the books, you might be able to move them up two notches with a raise. Now for D&D players, same thing. GM, make a DC, probably a 15. That's the average DC. On a 15, they move it up one notch. On a 20, they move it up two notches. I think the limit of two notches is massive. Now that's in one interaction. Maybe they come back to the NPC and they've already had good trades with them. So they start one degree better because you've already proven that you can be trusted. You've proven that you follow through on your deals. So the next time you work with them, maybe they'll be willing to do a little more. And now you have NPCs you're slowly building relationships with, which makes reoccurring and a lot of time valued NPCs in your game. It also means if you need an NPC to be as good as it gets on how much they like you for a task, maybe you gotta do a bunch of different missions. Maybe you have a little quest line here. And just a little side tip, this isn't a video game. This isn't as soon as you finish mission A, they have mission B for you. Maybe you do that and they're like, yeah, but I'm still not willing to do that. I Look, if something else comes up or if you need something a little less demanding, we can talk. And then down the road in a, in a session or two, they come back, have another job. You don't do it back, 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 back. You spread it out. You sprinkle it. Make it feel a little more organic. Number three. This one is taking a rule from 5th edition D&D, and it is a rule you can use in Savage Worlds for you Savage Worlds players. But I'm also going to say, you 5th edition players, this is a rule buried in the DMG that a lot of the rules in there get ignored or not even realize they're there, and it's the morale check. 
Now here, I'm gonna have the listing for it pop up. These are a bunch of example conditions for individuals and for groups. And when this happens in D&D, they make a wisdom save. DC 10, it's actually not that hard. But if they fail it, they flee. And this is stuff like half of the group has already lost. Their leader has lost or turned. Those are the big ones. Savage Worlds, what do you do? You just give them a spirit check. That's it. Just give them a spirit check. And I would actually say for D&D players, for every additional condition that's being met, maybe they've lost half their numbers and their leader has now died. They have to make a new save and for D&D, increase the DC by five for every condition that's met. For Savage Worlds, give them a minus two. Real simple, real easy. But here's the thing. First of all, GMs, this means in combat, you can throw encounters that the party could not win. They could not kill all of them, but they don't have to. They have to be smart. They have to take out the leaders. They have to be intimidating. They have to scare them off and make the side think they could kill them. It's not about actually wiping the board with everybody. You can do the same with Savage Worlds because Savage Worlds doesn't have the strict CR system D&D has. So with that one, it's actually even more important of even if you just take this and give this to the players as a reminder of, hey, you don't have to kill everybody. We're not murder hobos in every game. And scaring them off, driving them off is great. I do this combined with a few other things that I'll cover in a social skills specific video later for Savage Worlds. But for now, just the standard morale rules adds a lot of dynamic capability in your games for NPCs. This next one isn't a rule from another system. It's have index cards. More importantly, I personally get the multicolored packs of index cards. I show them, but they're in the other room and I didn't think this through. But have index cards and use an index card for an NPC. Write the NPC's name down. Write their traits down just on the card. That's it. And again, their traits, their quirks, they only have to be one word sometimes. Has a lisp, stutters, twitchy eye, hates elves, just these little things. You likely won't fill the index card up. There's two things that are good about this. First of all, even if you don't fill the index card up, keep them per card so you can remember them. But also that leaves room for notes from the players maybe change something about the character or we've discovered something about the character that you just came up with on the fly, you add it to the card. The other great thing is a lot of GM tips and stuff say like, have a list of NPC names and just scratch them off when you wanna use them. Make a deck of NPC cards with little quirks already on them, but don't say what their profession is. And those are your like side characters. You can shuffle up those cards if you need and you draw one at random and once you've drawn him and you said he's the blacksmith, then you write blacksmith on him and he's set. You don't have to remember the list. You're not looking through the list and deciding one. You're picking at random. You got it. Now, granted, again, if it's like dwarven names, you have your dwarven deck. But if you don't know who they are at all, just pick one completely at random. But you have the name. You have some quirks already set up. And you just decide where that NPC you kind of came up with one day because you were bored goes in your world huge time saver and with the cards only the npcs they've interacted with you need to have with you if they leave town take all the npcs that were in that town put a rubber band around them and keep them with your notes for that town so when they go back to that town you just pull those cards out and you have them right there huge time saver great way to organize i highly suggest it. now finally Number five, and this one I save for last because it's my absolute favorite. My biggest tip for how to get NPCs that your players love is ask the players about the NPC. If your player has a contact in the Thieves Guild, you ask them who this person is. What race are they? Uh, tell me something about them. And you take it and you roll with it. They don't have to give you the entire bio but let them have input on NPCs, especially ones that are tied to their past. If they have some kind of class feature or edge or something that gives them contacts, let them be involved. If it's the dwarf and they go 
to the Smiths Guild or they go to the Dwarven High Court. Let them get be the ones that be involved. First of all, even if they're not there, say the Dwarf player got arrested and the rest of the party has to go to the Dwarven High Court to petition to get their friend out of jail. That player's kind of on the sidelines. But if he or she gets to decide some of the NPCs in the Dwarven High Court, even just their names or a tr personality trait, they're still involved, which keeps them active at the table. On top of that, for all your players, if they have invested even a little bit of thought in that NPC, whether they know it or not, they have more of a bond to that NPC. They're going to care more about what happens to that NPC. And getting your players to care about NPCs is the real secret. I would much rather have my players tell me who the NPCs are and they care than me spend an hour making an NPC they don't give two craps about. So with that, that is five tips for NPCs, and I'll catch you guys next week. Bye!